I think a night at an unlicensed boxing do, a good one, is better than going. It was better than going to I don't know Earl's Court or the GMX up in Manchester, and see Ahmed ponce about and knock some geezer out in thirty seconds, and it's cost you a fortune. You know, it's a much better night. There's no doubt about it. Unlicensed boxing nights, if you hit the right night, is a good night. As good a night out as you'll go anywhere. Alexander Palace. Well, I know it's not proper boxing, but that's not really what you was going there for. You know, very few people go to boxing to watch the finer arts or the Queensbury rules. They go to watch two testosterone filled men try and hurt each other as much as they can, only using the rules that they are given. Uh, but I've got a lot of respect for unlicensed boxing because, I mean, sometimes you see guys that you see a lot of heart. This shows all around all around the country. It's becoming really popular. Um, yeah, I, I don't. I can't see it being televised or anything like that. I think it'll always be underground. That's what makes it what it is. That's what makes people want to watch it. You know. Right now, everywhere you look, there's what they call semi-pro and licensed fights everywhere now, and they sell out. You'd be surprised they sell out. And then you got some professional fights, and it's shockingly horrible. You'd be surprised, you know, big names, but no, no one coming to watch. But um, maybe it lacks the, the, the spice and the excitement that there is in unlicensed, you know what I mean? But if, you, if, you, if you come to an unlicensed fight, I see this, you are definitely going to have fun, you know what I mean? There's a, the atmosphere itself is, is really good, you know, and you will have fun, to be honest, you know. Unlicensed come from the British Boxing Board of Contract, which was a bit cheeky, really, because it makes it sound illegal, which it, which it isn't. But they branded it unlicensed because it wasn't licensed to, like, to the board. Which uh, it all started when uh, when Roy Shaw came out of prison, as you probably know, and he tried to get his pro license, and uh, because he had a criminal record, and that mixed together with a little bit of his age, they give him an hard time and said, and they refused him. So. Uh, you know, in them days you didn't have as much as what we had to do with strips and the trade and all that type of stuff. So the lawyers, what were going to go around and doing that? So the only option they had was they went like, put two fingers up to them and went, I'll tell you what, we're going to do our own thing. Unlicensed boxing was known to be a little bit more, the rules were a bit more lax, so you got more action. Uh, this, uh, this brought out stars such as Lenny McLean, Roy Shaw, Harry Starbuck. Colombo and, and right now you are only allowed to punch that guy in three minute intervals with sponges tied to your hand. Well, years ago, you know, you could throw the odd nut near him, right? When he went down, you could get away with your kick in the head. You know, it, it was a lot more exciting. You know, and, and, and you very rarely got one stretch on for 12 or 13 rounds. You know, I mean, they were over in three or four minutes. made in there and the enemies that were made in there and the, and, and if, if walls could talk then Caesars um, used to be the cat's whiskers then. Uh, Caesars could be the best storyteller in the world. You know, it is um 
the actual building smelt like combat, right? I don't know what it was like on the normal Saturday night dancing, but it was it was still a bloodbath, right? The place just smelt like you should fight in it. Whatever that smelt like, it looked like, you know, there was dents in the wall. There was, you know, you, you could look, look. It just looked ag. And the Roy Sean Lenny McLean fights actually brought the whole of unlicensed boxing into the public eye. Right? They were individual stars anyway in the criminal fraternity. Right? They were, you know, for, for their own individual reasons you know they were stars anyway so for them two to actually end up having combat of each other that was uh, you know as entertaining as Rooney and Beckham having a one against one you know it, it was it was something to watch and they all had their own following but Lenny was a big strong guy hell of a strong guy um, the first fight Roy beat him which is a shame it wasn't caught on film but he did beat him I was actually there uh, second fight uh, Lenny beat him, and the third fight, you know, uh, we, we, we've all seen it on the governor. You, you know, Lenny destroyed Roy. You know, Roy, uh, Roy said he was on them pills, the ginseng. You know, if he says he was on them, he must have been on them. Uh, there was a big age difference, hell of a lot of age difference, you know, between Lenny and Roy. You know, Lenny was, what, 28, was he? 20, something like 20. You know, he was, and Roy was like, nearly 40 or in his 40s so you know it was a big age difference big height difference and uh, Frank Warren even said you know if Lenny would have turned pro he would have been a good pro because most of these fights had to happen low key undercover and no one could so you couldn't advertise you couldn't post up with a flyer or see if you can sell some more tickets it was all done through word of mouth and down the boozer well Jay Parr wanted to spice it up you know he wanted to put some some publicity around it and earn some proper money like winner take all, ten grand and things like that. Well, I don't know if you, you're aware, but professional fighters can, can go home with two and three hundred quid. You know what I mean? That's all they get. Four, five, six hundred quid or something. And he can't have another fight for seven weeks. Works out at seventy five pound a week to be a professional boxer. You know what I'm saying, man? Well if you get one of these like Lenny McLean fights and, and, and Roy Shaw, that conjured up the imagination, winner take all, it was too many, you know, they didn't even want a round, they didn't want a bell. They weren't technically the greatest boxers in the world, but they loved a scrap, you know. Uh, and they actually weren't cutting it on the skill level, but they were making up for it in the arsehole level, right, in the guts and the, um, the rocky stuff, you know what I mean? So they, it sort of branched out and then the unlicensed boxing came in, uh, which is... I mean, personally, I think it was a little bit better a few years ago when there weren't so many sort of health and safety rules around it, you know? Now you've got a doctor and you've got a, a ref that does know what he's talking about and the rounds are more or less the same time each one, you know what I mean? But in them days, it was... Uh, there weren't no doctor present and you just battered the living daylights out of each other until someone was bleeding a lot or lying on the floor. Maybe the fellas were a bit more angrier back in the day. You know, because obviously back in the day you could have a little punch up and it was all cool. Um, nowadays you, you've got to have things in place like doctors, St John's ambulance, medicals, um, weigh-ins. You've got to do things a, a different way, which is, is taken care of by the other half of the team. Can I just say that being an unlicensed show, um, it, it means, now there's no government mandate in this country for a, a boxing board of control. Now the boxing board of control are a limited company. They are a company, end of story. No one um, can say that they have got a government mandate whatsoever. So anyone can put a boxing show on. Uh, I expect a lot, of, a lot more gore. A lot of villainry, um, a lot of a lot of razzmatazz, you know. Um, it's, it's a bit, yeah. I think it's more interesting to watch than your clean cut boxing, your white collar or your amateur. Sam Butler. There is a terrific atmosphere here at Caesars. Um, there's never been, as far as I'm aware, a special night. We have the old title fight, of course we do. But, you know, people come here because they know they get great value for money. They see guys really going for it, and, and I thoroughly enjoy it. I would rather go to an unlicensed show than go to uh, most pro shows. 
obviously, like uh, when you got a big show like a Ricky Atten show or David A show at uh, O2 Arena, I mean, the hype's there, so you're looking forward to it. But if someone said to me tomorrow night, Joe, come to your call. Uh, it's just a standard run of the mill um, eight fight card or something like that. I'd go a couple of bottles. Because you know what you're going to go and say, you, you, you know, you might get a couple of good fights, you might, but if you come to an unlicensed show, you know, you might get two guys in the ring, never box a fight, and they, they, they ain't got a clue how to box, but they've got to stand there and swing fucking out of each other, trying to hit each other. It's, it's, it's entertaining. And then on the top of the bill, you might get someone like, uh, you know, like Sven Aimer fighting another, fighting an ex-ABA champion. Two big heavyweight guys got to stand there and throw bombs at each other. So, you know, across the field, you've got like a, you know, it's an entertainment evening. I wouldn't say it's a boxing paradise or a boxing connoisseur, but for entertaining evening, the unlicensed is, is hard to beat. It's a very primitive sport, as you probably appreciate. Um, there's a massive amount of skill involved as well. And boxing, you know, boxing is one of those things that is not that difficult to pick up, but it can take a lifetime to master. Well, the, gov the governor title is something which we inherited. You know, there was a big, there was a big dip when when Lenny and Roy gave up. It, it went, you know, it was useless. And then uh, Alan Maltlock was doing the shows. He, had, he he was doing it. And then Ricky English started doing a few of the shows. And then Ricky came to me, and we was doing a, a few of the shows. And then we resurrected the governor title. And uh, and you know, Sven won that. And we had Norman Buckland won it. Uh, Joe Cax, uh, then he, he beat Sven. When Sven Aimer defended, he had it for about five years. Then Joe Cax beat him. And then uh, Norman, and then Joe Cax was stripped. And Norman Buckland won it. Norman Buckland gave it up. And Joe Cax came back and won it again. And he fought Gary Sayers for it when they all went outside the ring. <laughs> they both went over the top and started punching each other outside the ropes. You know, and that was a bloody man, that was. Uh, so, you, you know, he's still there, but, you know, Sven Aim would, would have held his own with Lenny and Wood, you know, on his, on his day. But Sven was a good pro. I used to promote him in the pros, promote him at Wembley, won the Intercontinental title. It was a good fight. Well, as things stand, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen boxes. Now, one of them boxers, six people are coming with him. Another one of them boxers is two. Another one is three. So, realistically, if there were 17 people plus six, plus two, plus two, that's 10, 27 people. But sometimes what I do, that's my half of things. My partner, who organises all the doctors, the rings, the venue, tickets, posters, He's got his boxes and he does his half of things. So now I've got to ring um, the Luton boys, make sure they're up to scratch. Jamison, it's Uncle Teddy. What's that name, boy? Jamison. <laughs> you, thought, you thought he's the IRA, yeah? <laughs> You've really got to leave women alone when you're up, coming up to your fight. You want that aggression. Because if, you, if you've got a smile on your face when you get in the ring, mate, someone's going to wipe it for you. Do you know what I mean? And then when you wake up, you won't be... Yeah, when you wake up now, you're not going to be thinking about birds. You're going to be thinking how many sort of like... Your reputation's out the window. You'll be seeing birds and stars. Okay? Teddy, what's wrong with me? Turn the Christmas lights off. <laughs> They're not on. Right, let me get on with some work. I'll speak to you later. Bye. The way I got into it all was years ago with me mate. Darren, he went and put himself up for a fight and because we knew it was this prize fighting, I wanted to make sure that he was in good condition. I used to be in good condition them times. So I wanted to make sure he was in good condition. So I said to him, I will train you and I will help you sell your tickets. So off we went. We'd done two training sessions and that was the last I saw of him. So I used to sort of like have a go at his missus Sarah, love her little soul. 
saying to her, like, if he gets knocked out, it's your fault. <laughs> right. So after that, it was just sort of like in and out, in and out, in and out, until a year ago when I decided, like, it's time to take this thing a little bit more serious. Once you've had that talk, yeah, I don't think yeah. any other talk would really affect you. Because if I started saying to you, no, it's an easy one, you'd say, hold up a minute. He can't be telling the truth. He can't be telling the truth. You know what I mean? Now, once you've had that talk, once you've been knocked out, you'll learn from it. You pick yourself up, brush yourself up, and start again. You don't really feel the punches anyway, too. If you don't know the right promoter, and you don't know, basically, you've got, you haven't got your, your toes dipped in any pies, then you're not going to be earning any money in it. So basically you could just be training for nothing. But if you sort of get the right promoter, the right team behind you, then you can earn some serious money out of it and become a success. A lot of the boys, yeah, when we used to first come and sit down in here, they never had nothing better doing. Just arguing and fighting amongst themselves. Now, we encourage them, if you've got an argument, bring it to the table. If you've got beef, beef, Bring it to the table. Sort it out, basically. You know, instead of talking about who can do and who can't do, you got beef. Bring it to the table, and then we resolve it that way. And then everyone have a little bit of respect for each other, just a little bit. Yeah, I think it's the real, it's the original unlicensed venue. You know, um, Caesar's Mean Machine. Uh, uh, their their governor title goes back from the days of Lenny McLean and Roy Shaw, and it is the original unlicensed underground, you know what I mean, it's, I, I, I think we got the best fighters, but it, you know, it's really that, that, that name, you know. Now ladies and gentlemen, in the blue corner, from Tootin, the to go to a boxing match, I think it's probably best to start at something like this, or an amateur show, because if you go to a pro show, then you come here, the, the, the huge difference is that I think these are more fun than pro shows. Pro shows, are, you know, they, they run very, very tightly and everyone knows what they're doing. Here, it's a little bit anarchic, but it's, it's, it's possibly more fun. So do it this way round. Come to one of these first, go to a pro show later, but don't do it the other way round, because the expectations you'll have will be completely different. Please welcome me to the ring. You've got to like the sport to go over to it. You're not going to spend £45. I mean, I wouldn't spend £45 to go and watch fucking snooker. You know what I mean? So it's for a like, you know what I mean? If you like boxing, you're going to watch it. If you don't, you're not. <laughs> Thank you, Giles, and across the ring, ladies and gentlemen, please, please give a big old welcome to, from Brixton, Alan Kitson. My name is Alan David Kitson, nickname K.O. Kitson, K.O. Mean Machine Kitson. <laughs> and I'm from Brixton, South West Line.
Well, that's the thing. I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not the most overconfident people. I, person, I've got confidence, you get me, but I know I'm 33 years old, I know it's a late start, you get me, all I can do is give give what I can give and I know that, I know my who I am, the personality I, I've got, you get me, I know, say, I know I'm a, a pretty good boxer, I've trained, trained for a long time, I've got a bit of experience and I enjoy it and I love it, that's it. about winning for me like I don't think I don't know if I could deal with um, a loss too well I not when I say I couldn't deal with a loss too well I've, I've got no problem losing to my opponent I mean if I'm beaten by an opponent he's as far as I'm concerned he's a good fighter he's better than he must be better than me and I'm gonna have a great respect for him I've got no problem losing to him I've got a sportsman I'm a very good sportsman I've got no problem but I'd be very hurt for my supporters and people that's come out come out for me to see me fight and stuff like that, you get me? And like, um, yeah, I would, I'd definitely fight for my supporters. I would be trying my best, no matter what, you're gonna get a fight from me. A lot of the boys, as I said, they come off of the street. Rather than stab each other up or shoot each other, if you've got a problem, isn't it a better place to do it? In the ring, in front of 800 people, and may the best man win and take the prize. You know, and, and you know, everyone's fighting against knife crime. No one wants to see anyone get stabbed up. It's not really a fair way of doing something. So ultimately, yeah, I think most people would prefer to come and watch two people who are having an argument or a dispute, get in the ring and resolve it with a pair of gloves and the, the safety net of doctors, ambulances and a ref. So yeah, ultimately, I would prefer to watch it that way as well, rather than someone getting shot or stabbed, because it's a waste of time. Before I started boxing, I was like a very aggressive person, loud, shouting at people, fighting. Just basically, when I'm going out clubbing, I just wanted to get in the fight or whatever. But now I've started boxing and that, I've learned to calm down and it's not worth fighting people in the street or whatever, just take the anger into the ring. If I stayed on focus, I think I'll be in prison. Well, sad to say, probably dead. Just the worst, really, like the worst things that can, that can happen, really, yeah. I'll be probably, I'll be probably selling drugs or robbing like a lot of my friends in Brixton that my mates I grew up with. Get me or just there yeah, being or in jail, probably. Not everyone can see it's a good thing. Like, take for instance, I got this uh, 16, he was 16 at the time, his name was Troy, and he had a lot of potential. He was really good, well versed, a tile fucking, he was a kickboxer and he was a boxer, he just wanted a chance. He comes from a background of like uh, fostering and uh, he's seen a lot of heroin use and uh, he was a thieving and uh, using drugs himself. And me and Joe got him away from that side of the life into boxing and he's fighted on a couple of shows and the police come to the show, said he's in foster care, he's 16 years old, blah, 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 uh, he's not to be fighting on the show. So the police have basically cut off that avenue where he could have a good life and something good, you know what I mean, sports and fucking, and they've sent him back to the avenue of nicking cars and blah, blah, blah. But anyway, that was about a year or something ago. He's old enough now and he's going to be fighting on the next show and he's one to watch for, he's going to be good. Got into unlicensed boxing, it was quite funny actually. My uh, clutch went in my car and uh, basically I needed to find a way to uh, pay for it. Um, seen a few fights, went down to uh, Streatham and basically got involved from it from there. They asked whether anyone wants to take part and you know, I took part.
never stepped in the ring before. Thought I'll give it a go. Yeah, good nights actually. It's uh, you know something I've wanted to get involved in. I could never be a pro, but um, you know it just gave me the opportunity to do it. You want to go to the next best thing. Some people take up amateur. Some people want to make money. To be honest, I like to make a bit of money and have a bit of fun at the same time. Basically, my first fight for me, Machine, um, <clears throat> the guy came in the changing rooms and um, he said, he said, who's Peter Stogan? I said, I am. And he said, oh, I'm not fighting you. And this, this was at five to seven, just as I'd sold thousands of pounds worth of tickets. Everyone was coming in, so I was gutted, I was sick. So my brother's come in and he said, right, he said, I'll box you. You know, if I get paid, I'll box you. He had his kits and his shawl. I mean, he's a very good boxer, we come from a fighting family. And he, he, he took his kit off, got in the ring, and we we done a three-round exhibition, and uh, it brought the house down. And on that performance, <clears throat> um, Joe's offered me a title fight straight away, um, which I won, and then I won a second title. It just meant so much to me. It sort of <clears throat> gave me give me a, a, a worth in life, you know. I'm really proud of them titles. I put a lot of work in. Um, now now I'm going to be fighting for the heavyweight title. Um, I live three different titles in two different ways, no one's ever done that, so I'm over the moon.
Right, in Great Britain, the pride of Gravesend, the assassin, Peter Stoughton. And please show your appreciation, decent boxer, Mark Geraghty. Well, November, it was probably my best knockout ever. Um, it was against Paul Hill. <clears throat> it was challenging for the British title in only my second fight. You know, I don't think anyone's ever done that. Um, and that particular fight was just so focused. And I went out there, I hit him with two, he was a world champion kickboxer. I hit him with two body shots and then come out and threw probably the best right hand anyone's ever seen. It was voted the best knockout of the year. And I KO'd him and it, it was just amazing. But you know, I put in about eight weeks training for that. Um, I must have spent two, three hundred pound in, in professional trainers and it just lasted that quick. People say, was I bothered? No, I wasn't, you know. My mates, they like the idea. They think that it's good. You know, they probably think one day you become a celebrity. It's not that easy. But uh, my mum, bless her, she's, you know, a bit worried, but all parents are. Yeah, I get good support. Um, my sister, my uh, brother-in-law, they give me support. Um, all my mates, really, they just want me to do well. Win, lose or draw, it feels like you've been in a car crash. You've got about whiplash. It takes you about a week to recover, but, you know, it's worth it if you get paid well. I know it's unlike since boxing at Caesars, but I'm living my dream. I'm boxing, I'm back in the ring doing something that I always wanted to do. I'm not going to kid myself, I don't know how far I'm going to go with it or how far this, this is going to take me, but I'm living my dream. A lot of people I fell into the trap of, because I could have a little bit of a row on the cobbles, I actually believed I'd be a good boxer. Well, that's a completely different game. You know, um, uh, trying to train your body to, to, to actually fight in three minute bursts, and you're only allowed to hit someone with two sponges tied to your hand, you know what I mean? It sort of cut down, it cut down an awful lot of the rules that I had in my, my head about how to win a fight, you know.
as you know, because it's prize fighting, and the winner takes the prize, basically, yeah? You know, a lot of them come straight from the street. They, they've got no intentions of um, training. They, they see it as like, I can have a good tear up on the street, I'll get in the ring and I'll have the same tear up. A lot of boxers now, if you want to do something properly, take it serious, and they train as a, a standard sort of thing, an average standard. Um, when you train, you've got a better chance of walking out of the ring. When you don't train, you've got more of a chance of getting knocked out of the ring or knocked down in the ring, in my opinion. But there's guys that um, defeat science and, and they get in there, they haven't trained at all and they win all the, all the time. You know, if you've got a bit of skill, then you're off in front. Some of these people don't realise they want to do it until later on in life. You know, and obviously the amateur boxing thing is something really, they get into it at 11, 12. So a lot of these people now have got into it, just switched on, realised what they want to do. Um, and you, see, you do see some, some real talent. You know, it's not like a, a fight on the street, a little blow for a minute, you know, it's literally you're in the ring, you're both in there to do a job, there's rules and regulations, you, you touch your gloves and you get on with the business, so uh, you've got to train, you ain't got to cut corners, you cut the corners, you cheat yourself really, that's my main philosophy here. If you channel yourself, if you're training for boxing, you channel yourself to your boxing, you know where you're going, you're going to push yourself to go that way. You, you've got to have heart, you've got to have arsehole, you can't put any of those into a fight. That, 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 that human being has to have that in them. Um, also, you need to have a punch. If you don't have a punch, you've definitely got to have a chin uh, and, and, and ability. You've got to have a, a certain amount of ability. Um, if you ain't got any of those, then I'd definitely go into something else. dangerous game you know what I mean if you don't train yeah um, your whole body is kind of um, at a stage where you can anything can happen to you you know what I mean? but if you train your muscles are a lot and everything is ready you know what I mean if someone hits you with a good punch in the head you know what I mean you could get really hurt or on the ribs or anywhere you get internal internal bleeding or anything you know and these people they, they take a big risk going in the ring without training you know you can see how people look you know what I mean you know, oh I'm just gonna get through it and then that but you can get really hurt because one punch in the wrong place of the body could cause a blood clot, could cause um, anything that happen to you, you know? And then that could be the end of the story for you. Well, I normally start my workout with a bit of stretching, um, just to loosen up the muscles. Um, then I go into shadow boxing, which is mainly practicing moves for the type of opponent you're gonna be boxing. Um, this time I'm fighting a tall guy, so I was doing a lot of head movement. Um, a lot of body shots <clears throat> and then generally after that I move on to a bit of bag work um, again just practicing the same sort of punches practicing moves you know um, general fitness and then what I was doing then I was doing uh, strength exercises um, the basic press up which everyone knows and then I was moving on to neck exercises where I was rolling on my neck they're designed really for strengthening the neck, mu neck muscles so you can take a punch better um, yeah, just generally strengthening the neck muscles and then sort of sit-ups where you stand up, 
again that's for the stomach muscles and the leg muscles and you know basically they work a lot better than sort of weight training them sort of exercises although I do do a bit of incorporate a bit of weight training into my regime I train generally six days a week, um, sometimes twice a day. Um, I'm a full-time fighter. Um, um, basically, I have one or two rest days a week. I, I do a lot of my preparation at the Peacock because um, you're training around a lot of professional fighters. Um, it's a 50-mile round trip for me, but you know it doesn't bother me. Um, and generally, you know, you've got the best trainers up here and the best sort of fighters, and uh, yeah, I love it. I've got plenty of kids coming in, like I said, you know, and uh, I've got all different ages and sizes and people unfit. And it's not all about just about boxing, it's about fitness as well. So although I've got professional fighters, I have um, the general public coming in to get themselves in shape. And they do it like a boxer would do, but they don't get hit. That's the only difference. Double jab! Double jab! One, two, three! Three! One, two, three! Well done, he's putting you under pressure, that's what you want. <laughs> you got dedicated, they're strong, you know, they look fit, they, they train hard. And I think, you know, with a bit of encouragement, you've got one or two lads here that could go quite away. Uh, I've been training recently five, six days a week, uh, including that with my work. But, you know, you need to have a good old rest before you fight so you can go out like a firecracker. All the training that you've done has paid off. If, if, if you try, I heard this saying not too long ago, actually, it's the first time I've heard it, but if you're training hard, you fight easily, and I like that, and it makes sense. I think that's good stuff, yeah. I train every day, so part of the reason I train every day is just to keep in the lifestyle I'm at. In, like, if I weren't training every day then I'd be looking to do other things like run to, to, to the pub, which is a bad thing. Right, well, you're going forward, 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 and you're only learning one thing, which is just coming forward, so I want you to come back. So I'm just going to stop, just going to be pushing you back, keep yourself together, yeah? So as, you, as I'm pushing you back, it's just a little one-two, yeah? But you just keep moving backwards, that's it, and you're going to keep your form, you're going to keep your footwork, and all the time, I just want you up and down with your head. Up and down with your head. Yeah? Shoulders moving, head moving. Okay. Right, jab. And again. And again. Good. One, two. Right, I'm going to cut the ring off. You're moving around. You're always just trying to keep control of the ring. Two. Good. Jab. Good. Two. And again. Three. And move around. Keep the ring. Keep the ring. You're in control. Jab. Good. Good. Two. Two again, two again. Yeah, should we be able to do that? Hands up, good. A lot of these fights, uh, you know, you've got 25, 30 year old, you've got um, fights that are promoted, King of the Gypsies, if you like, and you've got, um, you know, some, some um, traveller coming from Wales to meet somebody from Southampton. You know, you've got this type of thing going on. And, and again, you know, it, it tends to be, you know, they, they bring their supporters and uh, you've got the excitement of that going on. This fight thing's taking off all over the country. Now, you're going to have your preferences. Some people like the MMA, some people like the cage fighting, some people like the professional. But, like, in my opinion, you know, and I know a good fight when I see it, I've been round plenty, you know. Um, a night out at a good unlicensed boxing do is better than any amateur, it's better than any professional. A good night out at an unlicensed do is the best night you will get in the boxing game. And better than any of that cage fighting. I mean, who wants to go and see Alex Reed ponce about, lie about his record, and hopefully, like, you know, get a, a picture of Jordan there flashing her pony little diamond ring? that she's just got. And the recognition that you're fighting in front of Roy Shaw and Joe Pyle and this is legendary and they're legendary people. So you know what I mean, if you, you know what I mean, it's just a part of the tapestry, you can choose to be a part of it. You know what I mean, you'll always be remembered if you fight here. Yeah? If you go and fight anywhere else, you'll fucking be forgotten in a week, but you have one fight here, you remember forever.
guy got in the ring, literally Sven beat him before the guy even put his gloves on. So I was terrified. And, uh, Sven hit him, went over, didn't want to get back up. A couple of fellas in the crowd went, woo, shout, screaming, I'll fight you. So he went, you want to fight him? Get in the fucking ring and fight him. So the fellas jumped up, said, I'll fight him. Next thing you know, we're gloving him up. Ambulance crew's gone mad, doctor's gone mad. Joe, what are you doing? I said, no, I'll let him do it. You can't fight a pro fighter. You, you can't get in the ring after you've been sitting there drinking booze all night long. You, you might think you can do it, you know what I mean? You got him with a pair of jeans on, you know, take me out of it, game boy, you know what I mean? You don't want to take me out of it, you know what I mean? You know, well done, you made the show, made it like that. But, uh, you know, made a lot of bollocks. But you can't hope to compete with a guy who's been training for like six, eight weeks, he's, he's got arms like that, he's fit as a fool, ex pro fight, and he's only one way, there's only one way where everyone fights with a he's going to knock you out, he's going to hurt you. And, and, you know, and that's what happened, which we're not to keep playing out of it. St. George's Hospital, carry on. And so and it was the same as the one late one in the night. It was the same as that one. You, you know, he, got, he, he had a good go. And he tried to stick the nut in, the elbows and the knees, everything else. But the other kid was a fit kid. And when he's hit him, when the other guy got, you know, give it 30, 60 seconds, bam, steaming in, all saying like, you know, you go out, you, you hit a bag for 60 seconds. You stay in there full pelt 60 seconds, hit a bag, right? Well, oh, 60 seconds, you'll be going, you can't fucking do it. And, and the other kid just stood back, let him done it, took the shots on, on the arms. And when the other kid got tired, then was like, you bang, and hit him, and that was it. Kid, yeah. God couldn't knock his hands up. Seconds out, first round.
Some of the fights we had with Norman Buckland, that was a funny fight when uh, we jumped out of the ring before the fight and started fighting with all the Arsenal supporters. <laughs> that was, someone was shouting at him, you fat bastard, or something like that. He was standing in the corner, he took his robe off and decided to jump out of the ring and jump in the middle of all these fighters. And all, all these uh, Arsenal boys had started having a punch up with a lot of them. That was before the fight even started. You know, we had to jump in, stop the fight. Norman, get back in the ring. So he's still fighter. Yeah, then he got in, knocked the other guy out, and that punched the other guy up the balls. The other guy, he punched him, so he's gone over. And then we've had to get him out of the ring. Uh, that, was, that was a crazy night. I think unlicensed boxing had a bad name. I think that unlicensed boxing is pulling yourself out of that doldrum, if you like. I mean, the days back in the 70s and the 80s, when you've got these great big fat guys and, you know, let's all fight for the Governor Championship, etc. And to an extent, that's still going on. But more and more and more unlicensed fights, um, they tend to have a younger type of fighter. You've got kids almost 20 years, 25 years old going in there and doing it. You've got people that are almost on the top of the game doing it. People that can't, they haven't got the, the time to go down the amateur route and certainly don't want to go to the professional route. And so they're, they're, they're taking more appearance, you know, pride over their appearance. They're making themselves fitter. And I think that with the shows themselves being run in a, in a, in a much better light um, and much more professionally handled, the whole thing, I think, has, has come out of that, that bad. You know, there is one or two um, shows about and, and fights that still happen and, and things that, that aren't regulated properly. But as long as the doctor's there, as long as you've got a good ref in there, as long as you've got good judges in there, and, and, and as just as important, you've got a good crowd, you've got a good fight. I wouldn't say it as a bad name, no, I wouldn't say it as a bad name, I'd say since that guy Richie came along and made that Snatch film, you know, that, that probably didn't do it any favours, so people think there's a lot of gambling going on and, you know, people throwing fights, but it's not like that, I think unlicensed boxing can get, you know, like youngsters off the street, you know, they're not fucking about with the gear or the drugs or whatever. Funny enough, they used to buy it and headbutt and stamp, and it was really. Um, I think it's gone a really lot forward now. I mean, you got all the doctors at ringside, you got all the ring girls, Wendy and the main girls. You know, it's it's all really proper outfit now. Well, it used to be the ferocity of the fights. There used to be hardly any rules, but now, like this last two years, like it's more Queensbury. But I think people still come because they still know the reputation that it used to have, fucking stamping on the stamping on the heads and all that sort of thing. But it's not allowed these days. When it was, uh, I started about three years ago, two, two and a half years. Yeah, about three. 
uh, it was still a bit naughty then. I have jumped over a few people's heads in here, but they wouldn't allow it now. Totally phew, disqualified straight away. Well, some people get too into it, you know, you're always going to find like these like overpassionate people, but that could often like be alcohol fueled, couldn't it? I mean, you know, I've only ever seen security come to the ringside once or twice in London. They've handled it really well. They're very professional, their security. Like a sport like boxing, it's gladiatorial, isn't it? So it's going to fuel passion and pe you know, people, people are going to get exuberant and overexcited, especially if they've gone all the way up there, a little team of them on a bus, on the train, in a load of cars from somewhere else, you know what I mean? And then um, their man's lost, you know, they've been full of the joys of spring, thinking he's going to win, he hasn't, you know, so whether they're feeling let down or what emotions are going through them, I don't know, but, you know, they do get upset now and again. I've had an awful lot of criticism from, from a lot of people about unlicensed boxing. All I would say is, before they can talk about it, they've got to see it. And nine times out of ten, they simply have not Basically, my role in the whole affair is I encourage the boxers, um, distribute their tickets and posters to them for the southeast of England, and sometimes, as you know, Luton, Bognor, whatever. Um, on the night, um, look after all the boxers, make sure that they're happy with their opponents, help out with um, matching the boxers, and basically just keep an eye on things where my partner can't, basically. Boxing's booming again at the moment. Promoters are paying the arms. Absolutely paying the arms. I don't know why. But, you know, if I, if I promoted for a living, I'd have been skinned years ago. I'd have done it. But uh, I love it. So, I mean, I love the game. And, 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 you know, even tonight I was meant to fight here. But it was a joke. What are you fighting for? 44 years of age. So, because every time I see the guys want to get in there, I'm going to get in there and, 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 and do it. You know, so I uh, promote, but it's, you know, it's a pain in the ass. We, we, the fight's pulling out on you all the time. You know, they bring you out, I've got a car. Well, today's Mother day, Mother's Day, we've got a show tonight at Mother's Day. Do you know, I've never known so many fellas taking their mums out for Sunday lunch. Do you know, I'm Sunday night, you, you know. It's, it's unbelievable, everyone today, you know, Joe, I can't make it. You know, I'll, I'll take my mum out with a milk, but they go, oh, hell, mate. You know, I'm you know. Second down, run, 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 Yeah. Mm -hmm.
game a lot of them are boys that used to be a bit in the pub a few pints I can have a tear up then you got a lot of them that were sort of like training to be boxers wanted to go pro or semi pro didn't get that um, break um, got a nice crowd that will follow them and they still want to do it with boxing if you haven't made it by a certain age it's very unlikely that you're going to be a semi-pro or a pro boxer. And I think they can tell by the time you're 15 or 16 nowadays, you know, if you're going to be any good. But a lot of them, obviously, if you're paying your money to go to a boxing club and you're half decent, they're not going to say to you, no, we don't want you. They're going to still take your money and say, come on, we'll get you in the ABAs, we'll get you semi-pro, we'll get you pro. And, you know, ultimately, that's what they do. That's what they run a gym. But a lot of the boys who come to fight are, are boys that they just ain't going to have the opportunity of getting on the pro or the semi-pro stage. I mean, I might not be right on this, but I think like since like the the uh, European laws have come along and all the different acts, that there's so many different, you know, like different associations with boxing. Now, it ain't like in the 70s when Ali was the champion and everyone crowded around the black and white in 1973 to watch him fight whoever, you know. Um, it's different now. You can set up this, you can set up that. You can't get done for misrepresentation, whatever. You know, and everyone wants to steal a bit for themselves, you know, because at the end of the day, like the amateur guys have still got money men behind them putting on the show, you know, so, you know, they're fighting for their few quid, aren't they? Second up. don't want to get it right you just want to throw someone in with someone then you don't do nothing do you, you just wait until the day and go well here do here do but to get it right you know we watch dvds i watch old fights and and see if, the, if there's an old opponent that's going to fight and i see how he fights and see if someone's suitable <laughs> The, the fighters that actually perform here come from all over the place. We've got them from Wales, we've got them from the South Coast, we've, we've, had them from, we've got a guy who came down from Aberdeen today. Um, they, 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 vary, they, they vary in ability, to be honest with you. Um, I'm, I'm actually sometimes pleasantly surprised, but other times not at all. The standard of the boxing is kind of give and take, really. I mean, you get some kids who think, why? Well, you know, he could possibly make a professional, but you get some guys that haven't got a clue. But having said that, this level of boxing isn't about being a world champion. It's about going out there and having a lot of fun.
basically they could be first timers, you know, i.e. the guys that uh, haven't got a clue about fighting. I mean, the promoters don't always know. They, they get a phone call and the guy will tell them he's done this and he's done that a lot of the time. They're lying, you know, and they just get up there and they're, they're, they're crap right, you know. Apparently there's this man called Kevin, this is um, uh, a Davis sensation, you know what I mean? And um, Thompson, I'd never heard of him before, you know what I mean? And then, um, so he comes up and um, they tell me I'm going to fight him. I looked him up anyway, I had no video, nothing about him. I asked everyone, no one has ever heard of him before, he's from Scotland, you know what I mean? I looked through the internet, uh, Dave Thompson, a sensation, nothing about him. And uh, I was kind of in the dark, you know? And I thought it was going to be some secret weapon from, from, from Scotland. So I did, I trained really, really hard for this fight, you know? I trained really, really, really hard. And when the, when the night came, you know, um, when I saw him, my first look at him, I was like, this is a sensation, you know what I mean? He didn't look like someone who did a lot of uh, training, you know? He was a bit chubby and all that, but he's not judgeable by his cover, you know? And I said, all right, let's go see what happens in the ring, you know? First round. Of any referee is to ensure the safety of the boxer. I mean, he was that was embarrassing. I mean, he, he, he told the promoter he'd, um, he'd, he'd box for the Commonwealth Games and uh, this and that, and he just didn't really try. I mean, I'd be embarrassed to fight someone like that. He doesn't make Joe Katz look good, he puts a lot of hard work in, it doesn't make him look good. No, you get all different sorts of fights. You get, you get a couple of handbag fights, maybe. So what's a handbag fight? Well, a handbag fight's where the boys, they can throw punches, but they're used to throwing punches in crowds. So you, you, you ain't got really, you ain't got to worry about hitting no one, because if you're in a crowd, you just throw punches and you hit them. <laughs> Whereas a proper boxer now, he'll pick his punches and then pick his target. So it's a, a complete different level of um, boxing. But on the night, I don't know, if you were saying to me, on average, how many fights do I think would be good? I would say out of 15, 12, 13, and you'll have two funny fights. And it, it, the two funny fights could be that the two fellas are just two different kind of boxers, and they just can't seem to hit each other. Round one! fight for me, a memorable one, was Joe Cax and um, Sven Hamer. That was um, really memorable. And, you know, I was proud of Sven because no matter what Joe done, he was hitting Sven with all his best shots. But Sven just kept coming forward. He was the governor, the tag title the hall now. So I've only been the governor for 10 years and no one had beaten him. And um, he does a record of knocking people out and all that. He's an ex-pro with um, quite a good, uh, good record. And um, big stocky fella, you know. And I trained for him and I was ready. So um, I was ready to go the distance with him, you know what I mean? Uh, the fight was quite a challenge, to be honest. We did uh, five, three minutes, you know what I mean? He didn't expect me to be what I was, you know what I mean? Because when the bell went off, I caught him a few punches, I shook him, you know? And um, he was very, very unprepared. Uh, 
um, he had three belts, and um, the three belts were um, one was a Joe Pyle uh, belt, and he had a governor belt, and then he had an, another um, EBF belt. So I took the three belts off him um, because he put them on the line of the night. So um, from nowhere, I had myself three belts, and that was the governor. <laughs> Being the governor, <clears throat> you kind of inherit the the, ba the bad boy underground title that that these tough men did hold back in the day. And Sven Hammer had the title for ten years. You know, I mean, everyone who tried to beat him failed. You know, I mean, he either knocked them out, stopped them, and then and that's what happened. And, um, and overnight, suddenly, I was the governor, and I was like, oh, I didn't know. You know, because I mean? if, if I was going to lose anyway, you know, what I mean, never heard of me, and. Um, he thought he was gonna go through his motions, but he 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 came to fight. You know what I mean? And but I beat him. Yeah. You know, he didn't knock him out. He might have beat him, but he didn't knock him out. And it was a good fight. Fen was the champion, I think, for about eight years at that stage. And being a champion for so long, it's easy to become complacent in the sense of you know no one ain't come forward that is a real challenge. You know, and all of a sudden you got another challenger. And, you know, you just ain't turned your switch on completely. You know, you've only given it sort of like 50, 60% of what you should have done. If you'd sort of like, I don't know, trained to his usual standard of training, he could have willed easier beat Joe. I went to a pro show and, and, and there was, I'm not going to name names, but there was two well-known black heavyweights fighting each other uh, at XF Sandy in London. And believe me, I'm going out of place. I, I felt like going to see the promoter Sandy and like, I'll tell you, can I be money back? You know I mean, you robbed me, absolutely died. And, and you know, and I've been to shows like, like what we have and, and, and the entertainment's been absolutely fantastic from two boys who never boxed before. You know, but they stood toe to toe and had a proper, proper punch up. You know, but then you're talking about the skills. You know, when we had Floyd Abbott boxing, Floyd Abbott, uh, you know, ex-British champion, ex-European champion, fought John John Molina for the world title. You know, you ain't going to get much better on, on, on a semi-pro unlicensed show than, than, than a fighter like that. It's uh, become more apparent that people want to go into something other than amateur, but not professional. Amateur stops at 34 years old. That leaves a great big scope, 10, 15 years of people still in their prime that want to do something. So we're, we're quite happy as a boxing club to start training people for unlicensed, but we have our own strict rules as well. You know, we're not having any of the big fat, don't want to, you know, don't want to train people. Um, we just want to get them in, you know, we want to train them to the best of our ability, we want them to be the best that they can be before they get in, or we're not putting them in. And once all that criteria is filled, then we feel that we've done a good enough job, and then they can be happy with their performance. Anybody that's not 100%, we wouldn't put into the, into the fight themselves. Well, professional boxing is obviously a lot better, although you do see some, like, good lads in unlicensed boxing. The amateur people, I mean, I, I don't know about nationwide, but down here, they don't like us. They've had a letter out. Uh, they don't, you know, they don't want anyone associating with unlicensed boxing. They won't box amateur again if they do. You know, there seems to be a real big rivalry. Uh, boxing's boxing, you know what I mean? Amateur, pro, boxing's boxing, you know what I mean? Once a fight comes to fight, you know what I mean? They come to fight. The things that sometimes, um, a bit, some unlicensed fights are, are not very, um, um, they go, they go wild, a bit wild, you know, and, and that's what usually happens, but boxing is boxing, you know what I mean? The amateurs 
don't want anyone fighting for unlicensed because they want to keep them for themselves. They know that they don't pay them nothing. You know, the chances of like some amateur trainer down there finding like someone who's going to go on to be a pro, like the odds of that are astronomical, aren't they? They're not going to find one, you know. So like they go and sell 50 or 60 tickets with us or with anyone in unlicensed boxing, they're going to earn some money. Whereas poncing about with an Edgar, they're not going to earn anything, are they? Apart from a night out for the family and a bit of crap dinner. Standards, are, some fights are really, really good. Good standards, you know? Some really good fights. And some fights um, are a bit disgraceful. But the last few shows have been really good, you know. I've been honestly, the last few shows, the standards have been really good, better than what you see in other in other shows, you know. I went to Brentwood and watched um, a few fights down there. I was I was appalled, you know. You know what I mean? But um, I, I, I could only say a lot of guys who come to see us now uh, are really good. Well, you know, let's say man's got to do what man's got to do. Um, I'm not for the unlicensed boxing, you know. I like to do it strictly for medical reasons, and for for as far as I know, there isn't medical checks are not really done so I'm not, I'm not a supporter of unlicensed boxing but if guys want to do it it's entirely up to them you know I'm not going to say you know you can't do it everyone's got free to do what they want to do but it's not something I would go into myself it's good in a sense I mean myself um, I had 60 amateur fights 10 years ago um, I'm 35 now I'm a bit too old to turn professional but you know it gives people like me a chance to get back in the ring and show what they can do. There's no discrimination about your age or anything. You know, as long as you can box, you know, you can do it again. And it, you know, it, it gives me so much fulfillment to to get back in the ring again at my age. You know, I'm I'm, th I'm 35 to be honest. Yeah, and no um, good promoter wants to sign with you when you're that age. They, they make excuses and all that. And then and I'll put on the hustle. You know, what I mean, of turning pro. <clears throat> You know what I mean? When you're on pro, you have to at least have seven hundred pounds for your medical. That comes with all the necessary requirements. You know what I mean? So everyone thinks uh, if I have to pay seven hundred pounds to box, you know what I mean? How much? How much am I going to earn? You know how many times am I going to fight? So that that's, that puts you off first time. Think about the license fee of seven hundred pounds, the medical and all that. You know what I mean? It's it's um it's like a daytime robbery to be honest, yeah. And pe people get put off because of that. These guys, you know, like they've been retired and. They've got an entourage, they've got people who'll come and see them, you know, and then like all of a sudden they're on the scrap heap. Now, if they've got another 10 years in them, kids, mortgages, that sort of thing, you know, they want to fight on. Well, why shouldn't they be allowed to? Unlicensed fighting is very, as, I say, as I've just said, is, is, is sort of akin with the, with the amateur. You've got shorter rounds, yes, and there's just, there's just as much excitement in it. Um, you tend to have short shot, quick shots, if you like. There's a lot more knockouts, maybe, you know. Um, and you can see people with skill that quite obviously need four, five, six, seven rounds. And you sit there and think to yourself, you know, God, if that guy had another two rounds, <laughs> he'd win this fight. But he hasn't. He's got three rounds. And that's exactly the same as, as amateur. And because it's the same as amateur, it's, been, it's pulled back into that realm. It's in that boundary, just like the amateurs. So. Yes, you do get as excited. I get as excited watching one of the unlicensed fights as I do with an amateur fight. Maybe not so with a professional fight, just because of the longevity of the fight. You know there's another seven, eight, nine, ten rounds to go. Of course you're going to be more excited. If it's a good fight, you want it to carry on, you know, as I'm sure the boxers do. But uh, no, it's three rounds, and I think that with the level of fitness that these guys have, three rounds is perfect for them, and, and, and that's what they're despite to. do see some talent there and wonder why they're doing that and then I, I come to the conclusion they're doing that because what they're trying to do is gain a lot of experience and use that over and above their sparring that they're doing in the gym and then maybe take that step into the professional ring um, but yeah there's a lot of talent out there 
what stops some guys becoming professional fighters generally is, is their level of ability, really. Um, you know, a lot of the guys, these guys come in here for fun. You know, they don't do it because they want to go anywhere. They do it because they want their mates to have a nice night out. They want to earn a couple of quid, get a win. And they often fight friends, actually. And, and that's what we've seen here at this, uh, at this venue. Um, and it's great fun. Pay 25 quid to go and watch a pro fight, you're going to sit there for 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 rounds and you're going to watch 12 rounds of jabbing and bobbing and weaving and people who have got the real bloodlust will rather pay 45 quid and watch boxing that's 3 rounds and people are actually going to fucking go hell for leather for 3 rounds. People pay to go and watch people get knocked out. That's why they go, that, that's one reason I go to watch unlicensed boxing to watch people go kill. I like boxing to be more savage. I think the ferocity brings the, the, the people. People come to see the uh, the fighters be ferocious. You know, what I mean, Lenny McLean. He was a good fighter. He was because of uh, the presence he carried with him. Same as Roy Shaw. The la. Ah! You know what I mean? You know what I mean? That draws people in. Uh, the atmosphere is mental. I mean, the first fight I had. You know, at first I won't shit in it, but when the bell went. That's when your legs start to go. You panic and you go in as fast as you can. I did that, but cardio seemed to fuck me up <laughs> at the end of the day. I won't lie, it's not a nice, I don't, that's the worst bit of it. I think, I think uh, I fainted a couple of times on the way from the changing room to the ring. That's just pff, fucking, you know what I mean? It feel the, it's like you're going to shit yourself, but. A thousand times worse, your heart's thumping, you know what I mean? And you're like, you look down at your chest and you can see your fucking, your chest shimmering from your heartbeat and like, and you get in the ring, then everyone, ah, and then sort of, it sort of goes then, like sort of it all takes over and then you just got to like, get it in your head that you've got to fucking hurt the geezer who's standing over there. You know what I mean? Get in there and hurt him. Nerve wracking, awful. Because so, I'm with him all the time before the fight. When I walk out of the changing rooms, I think it was the time before last, and I'm trying to look where she was, and I caught a fucking glimpse here, and I thought, fuck me, you look worse than I fucking feel. Yeah. It's so nerve-wracking. You'd, you'd gone white. Mm. White than me. Yeah, I don't move as well as I had Well, basically, everyone I've hit sort of fallen over, right? And, and I mean, he's, he's, he's been in the ring with some really, really good fighters. Sparred loads of rounds with, with, with top names, and um, he just basically, you know, he messed me about. He was laughing at me, telling me I couldn't hit, and you know what I mean, just doing old tricks what an old pro does, you know. And a lot of the time I was falling for it, but you know, he was trying to draw me in to lure me in to a full sense of security, and I wasn't having any of that. I sort of boxed clever, I boxed smart. I was very disappointed that I couldn't treat the fans to a knockout because I, I sold the most tickets there. And I really wanted to look, you know, good, but I won at the end of the day, and that's all I could do, you know. You know, you can hit a guy with your best shot, and it, it, you know, even if it really hurts him, he can smile at you, and you, you think to yourself, oh no, I've hit him with my best shot, and he's, like, you know, he might inside be feeling, ah. Oh. But yeah, a lot of them, a lot, especially old pros like that, they, they do all the old tricks, laugh at you, wave you in, try and get you to come in, and then boom, you, you know, they knock you out. 
and you've got to be very, uh, you've got to sort of shut it off, you know. And this guy, he was kept hitting me around the back of the head on the brake, you know, and um, it messes all your balance up when you get hit there. <laughs> I'm going to be the next big name. Um, I've got the heavyweight title coming up next, vacated by Colin Wilby. Um, I'll have two, three different titles at two different weights. I'll be the super cruiserweight champion and the heavyweight champion. No one's ever done that. And I'm going to defend that for the next five years and be unbeaten. And I want to, I'm going to give it back a, a new glitz to it all. I think in the future well, there'll always be um, there'll always be a little bit of unlicensed sports, but I think it's had its heyday. You know, when it was like, illegal to do and all that, that was half of its uh, appeal. And because it was illegal and there was no rules around it, you did get better fights. And I'm afraid now while there's the, unlo um, there's the cage fighting around, when they're allowed to do mixed martial arts and all that, the, the unlicensed boxing is going to come second to that, I'm afraid. Now it's had its A day. It'll always do it. It'll always be it. And you'll have the bare knuckles at the odd um, uh, gypsy sites and all that. But it's, it's, it's been and had its heyday, you know? With, with the actual petering out of the unlicensed game, right, it's lost a lot of individual stars and it's lost a lot of places that actually became famous, like, for instance, Caesars. You know, that was a mecca. You know, it was a mecca for the fight game. And I, I, for one, will miss Caesars a lot, and I think an awful lot of other people will. And it was a very sad day when it closed down, for, for especially for the boxing fraternity. It made a lot of people rich. The place made a lot of people famous. It, uh, it ended a lot of people's lives going to Caesars, and it, and it, and it made a lot of people's lives. You know, the actual club itself breathed. It lived. It was a person. You know what I mean? It was a person not a building and, and it's like a person dying sees his closing it's like a, a genuine funeral and that is a god's honest truth however pathetic that might come out Caesars was a person a living person and when that place shut it was like a funeral in its day um as it was actually turning not illegal, but unlicensed. It was the most exciting thing out there to watch.